Vader can't stop me now. The Force Unleashed 2 is a sequel to the best-selling, arguably most ambitious Star Wars game in LucasArts history. It's also a game I'm glad I only got for 3 bucks on a Steam sale, because I can't imagine paying 60 bucks for this. What a piece of junk! While the actual saber play finally feels satisfying and visceral. <laughs> With you slicing and dicing stormtroopers limb from limb, the sequel overall is such a tedious, repetitive game. In fact, while the game is only 5 hours long, it is the most exhausting short game I ever played. The game stretches out its 4 proper levels, Camino, Nemoidia, The Salvation, and Camino again. I said proper levels. Dagobah was one minute long and just there to trigger a cutscene. In those four levels, the amount of backtracking, the recycling of assets, and padded fights just wears down the entire experience. Even minor things like the mini bosses, who are at first neat fights with these cool QTE finishers, are undermined because the game keeps throwing the same mini bosses throughout the five hour long game. You probably fight the same mini boss type five or more times, doing the same rigid strategy, doing the same quick time events queue animations, over and over again. There's only three boss fights in the game and while they do feel better designed and play out like actual boss fights with stages and strategy to them, as opposed to just wailing at them with no rhyme or reason like in the first game, they just go on way too long. You got him where you want him now. I say that because the bosses have way too much health and the devs have you repeat the same sequences several times over. I'm aware of some of the best boss fights in gaming like in God of War have you learned and repeat these patterns. But Force Unleashed 2 takes it way too far with how much health they have, and it just makes the boss fights feel more exhausting than challenging and thus less rewarding. Besides the exhausting, repetitive gameplay, the writing itself is more unsatisfying than the first game. Starkiller, who is presumed to be a clone, breaks out of Camino. He goes to rescue Coda so he can find Juno. They find Juno, but she's kidnapped, and there's a huge battle to save Juno and stop Vader from making an army of Starkiller clones. Okay, who wrote this? You defeat Vader, save Juno, and the game ends on a cliffhanger with Vader captured and Boba Fett likely freeing him in a third, never to be released finale. While the game is better structured than the first game, almost like a film, it felt lacking and empty in ways. The story supposed it highlights didn't do it for me. Yoda and Boba Fett both appear in the game for some very brief, unnecessary fan service cameos. I say unnecessary because all Yoda does is tell Starkiller to go in the same cave Luke would go into. He's just sitting there. He doesn't discuss or impart any knowledge to Starkiller. He's just there to tell him to go inside. Then there's Boba Fett who only shows up to capture Juno, and we see him trailing the heroes at the end. All of this feels like they're just here because Empire Strikes Back was a sequel to the first Star Wars film. And so we need Boba Fett and Yoda for The Force Unleashed 2 because it's a sequel too. And of course, because fan service. I clapped when I saw them too! As for the main characters, they're just unbearable. Or at least, their acting is. No! I have no idea who at LucasArts decided to have the actors yell and scream at the top of their lungs for this game. Abandon ship! Abandon ship! Starkiller and Coda are constantly yelling and bickering, almost like they genuinely hate each other. We could launch a full scale- No! I just want- Look, I need a place to think this through. To meditate. To, to hide. Until I find her. We're at war and you want a quiet place to think? The Alliance will be destroyed while you're wandering the forests of Kashyyyk or exploring the caves of Dagobah. You'll let the galaxy die to go find yourself? Starkiller even shrieks at a couple points. You are a dead man. You lie! It's just off-putting and I guess they thought the characters and writing would be stronger and more emotional if they destroyed the throats in the process. Louder, more intense. Coda's wasted potential in the series continues. Let's hope she can reach us in time! He wasn't really a mentor in their last game, 
and now he's constantly berating and scolding you for only thinking about Juno. I know how you feel about her, but she's just one officer. We're going to lose the entire rebellion if you don't help us. Juno, on the other hand, continues to be the love interest lady character, except now she shows up even less, though still sadly having more screen time than Rose in episode 9. Yeah, I'm still not over it. You know why she barely shows up in the film. And Starkiller, besides the yelling, screaming, and just being all around insufferable with the acting, <laughs> doesn't have any growth of his own. They briefly touch on him having an existential crisis. I'm not Starkiller. I'm. I'm a clone. I was grown in a vat <laughs> to take his. But a clear focus for his character is being solely driven to find and save Juno. Juno! Juno! I still don't even know why Starkiller has feelings for Juno. Where is she? Or Juno for him. He just saves her at the midpoint in the first game, and then at the very end, she kisses him. I know Anakin and Padme were unbearable, but just because the acting is better doesn't mean that the writing is actually good, and Juno just doesn't form her own character in the games. Overall, the sequel is just bad. Just awfully bad. What little improvements the game made over the first one in the gameplay department is overshadowed by how unsatisfying the story and how repetitive the 5 hour long game is. Nevertheless, how do you make a AAA game feel repetitive in less than 5 hours? A sequel to the first Force Unleashed game that sold millions no less. What happened to LucasArts after the first game? Apparently the few details we have about the development is that it only had 2 years of development time, less than the first game. I'm also going to assume something else happened to the development team, like potential layoffs. And turns out there was. About 100 LucasArts employees were laid off in 2008, the same year the first game came out, including top figures like the vice presidents and producers at the company. The signs were everywhere, but now it's official we are in a recession. It seems like the 2008 recession hit the company hard, and it shows in a Force Unleashed 2. How it recycles so much, is padded, and feels like it's missing story segments. Like how Starkiller left Coda to find Yoda. Drop me at the nearest spaceport before you get lost in the stars. But then suddenly after Dagobah they're flying together and found the elusive rebel fleet. Speaking of unfinished, given that we never got a third game and it ends on a cliffhanger, it's obvious Vader wasn't going to be sentenced to community service. The series director discussed how he would have approached a final game, that it would have been a co-op game, with one playing Starkiller and the other Vader, and it would have been open world? Why does this sound like a shallow attempt to jump on the co-op and open world trend, popularized by Resident Evil and the Rockstar games? Because copying trends worked out so well for everyone else, right? It also sounds like the story and characters would have been compromised, just to make this concept of Vader and Starkiller helping each other work. There's not much more to say about the game, other than that I'm just glad I was so disappointed with the first game that I managed to avoid paying $60 for the sequel. I doubt we will ever see a Force Unleashed 3. Spectacle fighters aren't really popular nowadays like they were in the 2000s. And ironically, the more niche, hardcore soul style games are seen as more of a safe bet for big wigs at EA and LucasArts. And so ends my look at the games. One game that was decent but wonky too many, and the sequel being a repetitive, unfinished mess for everyone. A series that started out ambitious, a new frontier for Star Wars post Avenger the Sith, and it ends abruptly with a rushed and unfinished game, and a cliffhanger ending that will never be resolved or answered. As long as she lives, I will always control you. Thanks for watching folks. Sorry it's a short video this time, but there just wasn't enough meat or anything interesting or meaningful to talk about the sequel. If only someone fleshed out the story and explored the characters, maybe even do some interesting world building, anything to take advantage of the potential of the setting. So let's talk about the novels. Novelizations don't have the best of track records, but novelizations, just like video game to movie or movie to game adaptations, often are maligned for being perceived as supplemental products. No effort cash ins by writers trying to make a quick buck. But what about the Force Unleashed novels? You'd assume that LucasArts wanted to milk the Force Unleashed project, 
and so they just hired some author to write some disposable companion to the game, maybe adding some unnecessary backstory that would have made for a shallow Wikipedia article and nothing else. No meaning, only lore. But to my surprise, Sean Williams managed to not just write a more coherent story, but he fixes a lot of my issues with the game's writing and making me actually care about the stakes and characters. Though before getting to the good stuff, there's some things that I wasn't really keen on. I'm someone who is admittedly picky with my prose, or writing style. The first book suffers from translating too much of the gameplay into book form, especially the fight scenes. Too many countless fights between Starkill and Stormtroopers, Rebels, Aliens, Walkers, and more that go on way too long and are way too detailed. Not only does it get tiring to read the countless action scenes, especially in the first book, but it just had me begging the question, what's even the point of these scenes? Like why is Starkiller fighting a bunch of forest fighters on his way to rescuing Leia? It also doesn't help that Starkiller is pretty much invincible. I never got a sense of what Starkiller couldn't do or overcome. The result is that a lot of the action in the first book, and some in the second book, feels unnecessary. It adds nothing to the story or characters other than padding. In addition, the first book seems obsessed with telling you what lightsaber combat stances are being used. I don't think there's a single lightsaber duel where they don't specify whether Starkiller was using Form 3 Seruso or Form 4 Niman. But aside from these issues, I honestly think Sean Williams outdoes the game in almost every way in the world building, story, and characters, whereas the game stopped the ball hard. With the world building, the games really lack any interesting worlds or cultures. Ideally, the world building should also complement the characters and story, but it's clear that the developers had different priorities. Cool, diverse environments to look at and play in, first. Story, characters meaning, second, third. Okay, it probably was never that considered. But in a surprising twist, the books do a decent job of giving context and fleshing out the world Starkiller and others travel to. We learn that Narshada is being owned by the Huts, and that the Empire has been given a contract to build a TIE fighter factory, both because the Huts want to be on the Empire's good side, but also for a lucrative deal, a deal that doesn't even benefit the locals on the planet. So right there we see that the Huts are playing politics, but also getting into the war profiteering, which mainly benefits the Huts and the human-centric Empire, while much of Narshada remains destitute and crime-ridden. On Rax's Prime, we learn that Cass and Paratus was on the planet to begin with, so he can study the droid army and cobble up together the droids like medical droids to support the clone army. With most of the clone soldiers dying, he created his own droid soldiers, who coincidentally prevented Cassin from being murdered during Order 66. The author added some other neat deets, like how the Rodians are using Jawas, who aren't even from this planet, through bribes or intimidation. Another neat addition was giving the Jedi Master Mannequins an actual purpose in the scene. Kaz and Paradis animates them to fight Starkiller, to no avail. In the game they're just background dressings. We even learn why Kota is on Bespin, but Organa probably felt sorry for what happened to Kota, and sent him into hiding after Kota refused to aid him in the state. The Wookiees play a bigger role in the story too. In the game we just see the Wookiees build a space elevator to send more Wookiee slaves off planet, but the books expanded on it. While he's infiltrating the Death Star, he stumbles upon Wookiee slave labor, slaves who were shipped off Kashyyyk and used to help construct the Death Star. From there, Starkiller frees them and helps lead a Wookiee rebellion, causing chaos and mayhem, and in turn they help Starkiller reach the Emperor. With the sequel, there's some tidbits that stood out. Kamino apparently produces a significant portion of Stormtrooper clones, which is surprising given how the EU seems to agree that cloning ended also, it's suggested that other species have tried cloning, and they failed to clone anyone Force-sensitive as they all went mad, which gives Koda reason to believe Starkiller can't be a clone. On Amoidia, we find out that Koda was captured because he was trying to end the slave trade on the planet, as well as to kill the governor, to hurt the Imperial's hold of the system, and there's a neat piece of world building when Starkiller enters a casino, and notes how the governor was making money on the side off the local gambling establishments. Exclusive to the book is a notable addition of Mon Calamari. Mon Calamari has been occupied by the Empire, and the population's pass between the Mon Cal and the Quarren prevents a unified front, until Juno and Bel Organa help disrupt the Imperial occupation early in the novel, which pays off with the arrival of the heavy Mon Calamari star cruisers at the end of the battle. All these examples help build a far more living, breathing galaxy, 
that also gave a sense of purpose and context to a lot of the events in the books. In the games, I always wondered, why is there a TIE fighter factory over the crime-ridden planet? Why is Koda on Nomoidia? Or what was Juno doing before Starkiller found her? And thankfully, the author was conscious about all those things when writing the novelization. Story-wise, nothing major really changes in the novelizations. Most of the additions just fill in the gaps and develop the characters, which I'll get to later. But the biggest story change in the first book is the order of events. Instead of opening with Vader kidnapping Starkiller on Kashyyyk, the first book opens up with Starkiller already knighted and sent to kill Koda. And so Starkiller's origins plays a much bigger role in the story, as the book builds up to who Starkiller is, or once was, before he was abducted and trained by Vader. And Starkiller's identity, who he was, is, and can be, is far more emphasized in the first book. In the second book, the author fills in a noticeably missing second act, showing how Starkiller finds Coda and coordinates to the elusive rebel fleet by going to Malastare, a free port due to the lack of Imperial presence. But a major addition to the sequel novelization was the Mon Calamari subplot, Juno and Berogana seeking Admiral Akbar and the Mon Cal war support, and while it doesn't change the main story significantly, it gave Juno and Proxy time to shine, and the subplot introduced one of my favorite pastimes, military space politics. I say that unironically. I love politics and history, so seeing Juno, Leia, and the other Alliance leaders bickering about tactics, strategies, the risk rewards, and other political matters really intrigued me. Mon Mothma is surprisingly staunchly against bold, decisive attacks that the Alliance can't afford. She laments the loss of lives, ships, Coda, and so she demotes Juno for getting Coda captured and suspended from commanding her own ship. Usually Mon Mothma is portrayed as an inspirational, yet soft and passive leader. But here she pretty much intervenes and leaves Juno with no choice but to conduct secret operations behind her back. I doubt this subplot directly inspired The Last Jedi, discussing the responsibility of command, the military strategies, and the hardships really got me invested, even if it wasn't the focus of the Force Unleashed brand. The changes made by the author didn't significantly alter the story, but it definitely made the books feel more coherent and focused in the games, as well as filling in the clearly missing parts like especially in the sequel. As for the characters, the books give the flat, uninteresting characters and relationships the justice they deserve. Fleshing out backstories, giving characters more conversational scenes, and actually giving much more defined themes to tie in with the characters. Coda didn't get much attention in the novelizations, but they do give him a few moments alone with Starkiller. One of my issues with him in the games was how he never passed on some knowledge. In the sequel book, he at least offers a short lesson on patience and not being reckless, which he takes to heart. But the best part is that Coda isn't yelling or scolding Starkiller at every turn. Don't you leave us here! Proxy's handling in the first book is strange. I wasn't a fan of the out of nowhere fight with Proxy just because of his programming and the need for fan service. But the novelization replaces that with some artificial intelligence core that took over Proxy and wants to take over the galaxy. It's just jarring. On the other hand, Starkiller fighting to save his friend and deeply saddened when he initially thinks Proxy was destroyed really does show the bond between the two that the game failed to provide. In the sequel, they finally make use of Proxy's disguising abilities by having him take on the appearance of an Imperial commander so they can infiltrate the Imperial base on Mon Cal. You'd think that a droid that can disguise itself would come more in handy, but in the first installment, he's just a hologram projector for long distance calls. In the second book, because Proxy was damaged by Vader at the end of the first game, his disguising abilities are erratic, and it shows up one last time when Starkiller sees a vision of a dead Juno lying on the ground doing an Imperial ambush. In the game, when Starkiller arrives on the scene, Proxy just grabs his leg. In the book, his malfunctioning disguise has him looking identical to Juno, giving Starkiller hope that his visions weren't accurate and that the real Juno is still alive. As for Starkiller, the first book emphasizes his identity far more than the game ever did. The game's prologue is replaced, and we are slowly fed deets on who Starkiller was and how he came to be under Vader's control. We do see Starkiller confronting his potential future evil self in Visions when he arrives at the same hut he was kidnapped in all those years ago. But here's where his father's appearance not only makes his origins more satisfying, but it also shows Starkiller being saved by his father from the dark side. Speaking of father, his parents are hinted at, including his mom, also a Jedi. He flashes back in the second book to a Trandoshan raid on Kashyyyk and his mother disappearing to save him. 
This probably would have been expanded on if there was a third entry to the series. The first book ends thematically with Starkiller's last thoughts centering on how Hope will survive, and his last word is him whispering his own name, Galen. I also appreciate that Starkiller actually tries to sneak around in the novels. He's referred to as an assassin in the game, but in game he must be the loudest assassin I've ever seen. In the sequel, Starkiller, like Coda, avoids being insufferable in the novelization. He's more calm, he doesn't let out screeches, and a major positive change is how Starkiller now cares about the rebellion. He generally shows interest in helping the Rebel Alliance. He sees his family crest being used, and he wants to help free the galaxy of the Empire. In the video game, Starkiller is petulant and excessively cares only about Juno. There's countless times where he says he doesn't even care about the rebellion. He's just here for Juno. Starkiller, I know you want to find Juno, but we need your help. One Jedi could turn the tide of any war. I'm only here for Juno, General. Blast it! We need you on the front lines! And while in the novel he does succumb to prioritizing Juno here and there, he at least still cares a great deal about the Rebel Alliance. But the best character to have benefited from the novels is Juno Eclipse. In the games, she was just a pilot and love interest, the latter being painfully underdeveloped. But here in the novelizations, she absolutely shines. In fact, the author arguably treats her as the main POV in many ways. For one, she is just much more well-rounded and has more of a personality than Starkiller. She also has a meaningful backstory which haunts her and makes her strive to do better. That being how she inadvertently caused a planet-wide genocide on Catalyst because she followed orders. So in her own way, she seeks her own redemption, paralleling Starkiller, but more committed by doing what's right and joining then leading the Rebel Alliance. The games never gave her a good reason to join, beyond just doing what's good and Vader throwing her under the bus. Even if you point to the latter, it's still not a strong, interesting motivation. Having her riddled with guilt, having her question the Empire's methods, is far more interesting and overall, it's why she's the best character. In fact, reading these novels, despite my reservations of a third game because it seemed to chase a co-op and open world trend, and the game is just failing to connect me with the writing, again, these books aren't astounding works of fiction, but for what they are, novelizations of two underwhelming game stories, they succeeded where the games didn't by making me actually care about the universe, the story, and the characters. But before I end the video, I want to go through what interesting tidbits the author had to say on his time on the two novelizations, and he shares what could have been set up for the third installment. I highly recommend you listen to it, even if it doesn't give a ton of exclusive, mind-blowing revelations for the third game, it's so interesting to know what the process of writing a game novelization is. For example, funnily enough, the author admits that he padded out the books with excessive action, and had to mention the lightsaber combat stances, because George Lucas wanted to save the more interesting politics and galactic situation for his TV series. Uh, well, George had imposed quite strict um, ambiguities that he wanted to remain intact, like exactly when the story was set. Um, there wasn't to be a big. Dis it wasn't to be a political story, really. It wasn't. You know, the, the, the political status of the Empire was, was deliberately left a little bit vague, so um, that story could be told somewhere else if necessary. So that left quite a few things that couldn't be discussed in the book, which made things kind of interesting as well. So that's why in, in the book, uh, the first one in particular, there's a lot of discussion about Jedi, fight, Jedi fighting styles, uh, uh, because there had to be something in there. Whether Starkiller was human or a clone was left ambiguous in the books too, and was meant to be answered in the third and final entry. So it's deliberately left ambiguous, and, I, and my memory is that it was left ambiguous in order to be resolved in book three. So there are several, several things up in the air for book three, a, a, couple of, a couple of really big ones, and this is one of them. And I, I, know, what I, I know what my gut feeling is, uh, uh, but where, I don't know what direction Hayden was planning to go. Juno Clips was the author's favorite character to write and explore, and he laments how he wished he could just write the Force Unleashed 3 novel just to resolve Juno's story. Juno was so much fun to write, and I like her so much, and one of my reasons why I want to tell the third installment uh, so much is because I want to find out what happens to her at the end, or just nail down what happens to her. Interestingly, Mera Sprood from the first installment, and missing from the sequel, was not only supposed to return for the third game, but she and Koda were supposed to be linked together, probably as master and student since Koda didn't have any, and Mera Sprood's master was killed by a Starkiller. Yep, absolutely. She's back in our outline, and she has a big, big ending. 
that involves Coda. Oh. So Coda and Maris Brood, I think, are thematically linked in interesting ways, but separated, of course, you know, in years of age. But I think they're both, they have a lot of similarities, those two. The author admits how hard it is to write Psy Killer, particularly if it was a finale, since there's really no external threat to him, as someone who defeated Vader twice, came close to defeating the Emperor, and brought down an entire Star Destroyer all by himself. Because the trouble, the trouble with Starkiller is he's, and the, everyone knows this, he's too big, he's too good. He, he can bring down Star Destroyers, he can, he can do anything he wants, really. You know, he can beat anyone. Uh, so who, who do you match him against, apart from himself, um, that, uh, that would be cool? Or if you're not going to have him face somebody, who is going to face who to, to make that big ending? And what does pain me is that he claims there was a possibility of just exclusively releasing a novel to finish off the series, probably because The Force Unleashed 2 sold and was received poorly, and LucasArts shifted its focus to Star Wars 1313, meaning The Force Unleashed 3 was probably never going to be made into a game. But then before the book deal could be made, the Disney buyout of Star Wars happened. The, the outline we have uh, just deals with the characters we already know, and uh, if we had got the thumbs up. Um, there was talk for a while of doing it as a standalone novel, uh, and it came very close, came very close, but then I think the news of the deal came through with, with Disney, and I think everything was kind of put on hold. Uh, and if that had happened, uh, we wouldn't have been working from a script, we would have been working from our own ideas, and once we had the thumbs up, we could have then and have gone and said, right now, who, who's going to be in these places? Who, who can we bring into the story that will add, add to the, the story in a, in a thematic way? As I'm writing this, I came to a realization. If it wasn't for the novels, I probably wouldn't have really wanted to see a proper end to this trilogy. Now though, I want to see what becomes of Juno, Starkiller, and others. I even want to find out whether Starkiller was human or a clone, something I never really cared about until I read the books, and because Starkiller is just better written in them. Heck, as dumb and contrived Vader and Starkiller teaming up sounds, I want to see the characters get their resolutions, and maybe in the hands of the author, he could have explored the relationship between Vader and Starkiller, something never explored in the games or the books. It's a damn shame Disney will never greenlight a novel to conclude the series. They don't seem interested in ever continuing or finishing off the Star Wars Legends books. I realize that the Legends universe is a messy, inconsistent hodgepodge of ideas and stories from too many authors, and Disney wants to legitimize itself as the only true source of canon in all this confusion. Still, Disney can easily just set aside their ego and greenlight some books to put the Star Wars Legends EU to rest, as in, in this case, denying a finale to the Force Unleashed series. Congrats, Sean Williams. You managed to convince a non-fan of the Force Unleashed games to want to see the series end, either in game or book form. And now I'm grumpy we'll never see it. Right?